Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Walzak, and uh, I have the privilege of being here tonight as the president of the UMass Boston Alumni Association and uh, to introduce, uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here because, um, from what I understand, all of you are generous and longtime donors of 20 years or more to uh, all of the institutions that add up to University of Massachusetts Boston. Uh, just so you know, I, I uh, here, so the theoretically I'll be able to sit in. So the theoretically I'll be able to sit in one of those seats in four years. Uh, so I and and but I'm. It is a distinct honor to be able to meet people who have been longtime donors like yourselves. Um, because UMass, as we all know, is, is so important to Massachusetts, to what everything that we think about when we think about making a better state and a better city uh, for everyone and for all of the children that go there and all the kids and people like ourselves who graduated back in, uh, in those days. Um, it's a distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our chancellor. Chancellor Motley represents to me the person who is going to bring us to the promised land, and he'll talk to you about that um, tonight. But to, to me, the University of Massachusetts is a place that was established in, you know, in their, well, it was established a long time ago, but moved to the uh, Columbia Point campus in 1973 and had its uh, function of buildings. And the buildings now have, uh, have grown old and, uh, and are no longer able to accommodate the, how many people do we have, uh, students now, 15? 15,000 students that are now uh, at UMass Boston. So in order to be able to meet the demands of the future, we need strong leadership. We need someone who's going to be able to, to make sure that, that uh, he represents the interests of UMass to the broader community and is able to put together the kind of financial packages and political support that will be necessary to take us there. Um, the University of Massachusetts, as you know, is, is a, uh, it has grown on the shoulders of many, many other institutions that you probably, many of you probably went to. Just to list out the, our colleges that, uh, that brought us to where we are, the Teachers College of the City of Boston, State Teachers College at Boston, Boston State College, uh, and Boston City Hospital School of Nursing are some of our predecessor institutions. Did I miss some? No, okay. Um, and, sorry. So, so all of those institutions today add up to this wonderful place and this wonderful opportunity that's called the University of Massachusetts Boston. To say that this son of Pittsburgh took it on the chin on um, <laughs> Sunday when the Steelers played, but the Kraft family the other night at the U2 concert made sure they let me know that I was um, in um, territory that was uncharted for a Steeler fan. I was in the Patriot Hall of Fame for a reception for the University of Massachusetts. Um, but here's the deal. I was so proud that at the end of the night, over $100,000 was raised in scholarships for our students as a result of me sitting through that YouTube concert. And the, 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 un, the thing that wasn't known is I'm a fan. So I acted like it was tough to sit through the concert, but when they got to all the songs that I knew, that's when you saw me standing up and lighting my matches and all those other kinds of things at the concert. Good evening, everybody. I am just so honored to have you in our midst. Welcome to the University of Massachusetts Club. This is your club, and I know we could have done this on campus. We could have brought you home and had you somewhere there, but we thought tonight we'd share this little secret with you as well. It's a beautiful space, it's your space, it's one of the only spaces that's functioning effectively that sits as a university club in this city. Don't let them fool you when they tell you that you go into some of these other clubs and they're, they're so crowded that you can't get in. Mm -mm. This one has that problem come in here at lunchtime and it's hard to get a seat. So I'm gonna do you a favor and I'm not gonna use this microphone because as you can see, my mouth is kind of big already. <laughs> and so I'm gonna start by just saying that I am so grateful to Bill. Bill and your beautiful wife, Linda, thank you for being here tonight. Um, let me just say this. Bill's work with us doesn't, it's not limited to the alumni 
work of this institution. We put him to work on the provost search, and the fruit that that bared for us is our provost who's sitting at the table with me, Winston Langley, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. So we want, we're so grateful to you for that. Before I start anything tonight, Miss Dawson, Rebecca Dawson, sitting right here, 97 years young, a graduate of our gerontology program. At 73 years old, she graduated. Now you do the math, she graduated in 1985 at 73 years old. Thank you so much for making the effort of being here tonight. We're so grateful to you for being here. Thank you. You know, I'm so honored to have you in my mess. As I'm sure before the night is over, we're all gonna to touch you, all right? Because we wanna make sure that you know how important it is for us that you've made the effort. I'm pleased to be joined tonight by some of my other colleagues that are here. Um, we have Ellen O'Connor, who's the Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance. You're gonna hear from her. All this pretty stuff up here is not me. That's not for me. That's Ellen. She's gonna talk about all these slides and stuff. I just bring information that I wanna share about the institution. She's got all the slides and all the bells and whistles and all that stuff because we want to show off a little bit tonight too. And we'll get to her. But we have one of our deans here. Greer, why don't you stand up? Greer Glazer, who's here. She's from our College of Nursing and Health Sciences. She's here. And I know there's so many of my other colleagues in the room, but you're not here to work tonight. You're here because of your special designation as those who have given to this institution for a consistent amount of time, and I'll get to you, okay? I know I speak for everybody in this room, and then you know what a pleasure it is for us to have this opportunity to come together tonight. We wanna to formally uh, just acknowledge you um, as a truly exceptional group, a group of people who care deeply about the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and we're indebted to you. I mean that because for 20 consecutive years or more, you have been giving your financial support to this university. As chancellor, I get to talk to a lot of audiences about the University of Massachusetts, Boston, but I have not had the opportunity to speak to a group with a record like yours. That's why I wanted to bring you together tonight. I wanted to say thank you to you from our students, Thank you to you from our faculty. Thank you to you from our staff. Thank you for doing what you've done. You know, he's, um, Bill was talking about the promised land and the leadership that's necessary to take us there. You believe long before I even thought about coming to this institution in the power of this mission. I have seven years into the game of giving trying to catch up to your 20 plus. But I got it. I'm reformed. I know. I see what you see. I'm excited about what you see. And just when I, we were going through these records of giving and I saw this, our thing was to bring you together just to say thank you. Do you know how unbelievable it is that we have a group like this who are willing to give consistently to your university? That's powerful. So, thank you. Let me um, say this, because I don't want to get, I get excited, and I know Ellen has something she has to present to you. And she's looking at me like, don't take none, nothing out of my speech. Don't talk about master plan, don't talk about students and how many numbers are gonna be here, so I won't. I won't tell you there's 15,000 students on that. <laughs> I won't tell you there's a 25 year master plan. But when you made your first contribution many years ago, our fundraising program was in its infancy. We had no idea what we were doing, but you did. You understood that one day there was going to be this six foot seven gentle person coming onto your campus and he needed your help. So you set a foundation for him so when he looked in the books he saw that there are people who love this university enough to give. And that there is a reason to put your efforts into telling the story about this institution so everyone can get it. Everyone can understand the pride you have in this institution. 
everyone can understand the soul that you give when you teach in a classroom. Those of you that are in the faculty that are here or been on the faculty, those who benefited from learning there, that you can come back to school at 73 and graduate and go on and have a wonderful life after that and 97 and beyond, still be doing some wonderful things. That's the power of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. There are nearly 4,000 individuals now that are giving to this institution. It's, they're giving individually, they're giving as corporate donors, they're giving as foundation donors. Of that group, less than 3% have made annual contributions for 20 consecutive years. You're part of that mighty, mighty, mighty 3%. Do the math, 4,000, 3%. You understand? That's why I'm so proud of you. Not like 20 years of the 40, 20 consecutive years plus. Some of you have been giving more than that. So thank you. Harry Brett is not here working tonight. He volunteered to work. He's here because he's given to this institution over and over and over and over and over again. I was walking in a meeting one day, Harry Brett walks up to me and gives me a check to lead a, um, uh, the chancellor's council or something, I'm like, Harry. Then I looked at his giving record and I should not have been surprised. Harry Brett not only gives with his, just like many of you do, you're giving every day, he knows that that hard earned will make a difference for somebody, so thank you. So that's why he's sitting down right now, not taking my picture at the podium. <laughs> Because he's part of that 3% tonight. Give him a round of applause. You have been donors for more than half of our age. Some of you. We're 40. Some of you donated 40 years. Some of you, you know, half, at least half the time we've been in existence, you've been given your hard earned. Thank you. Do you know the example that sets when I talk to people? When I go and I show up? And I tell them 3%, they, you know, they don't think we raised any money. Then they see the record-setting fundraising years we've had. Our percentage in fundraising, and this is a story Ellen said to me today. She says, why don't you tell this story more? Our fundraising at this institution has positioned us so that when we come out of the box soon to do a campaign, you're going to be so proud of your university and the kind of money we're raising. Each year, we exceeded our goals. And now, even during this tough economy, we've exceeded them to a point where we had to make an um, assessment. How far do we want to say we want to go next year? Because we were like kind of in shock. Not because we don't believe in you, but because you believed in us enough to make us set a record that now the board's trying to hold us to for next year because we said we were always going, always going to improve five, six, seven percent. Now you know the more money you make, when we were at a thousand dollars, right? Five percent is not so much. You get up to twenty million dollars, which we raised this year, starts looking a little different. Now they want you to go to twenty-five. <laughs> Why don't you try thirty? You know. And we have such wonderful folk. The staff here from our advancement office stand up so folk can see you. I want you to know. Hard day work. See, strategically positioned all around the room. <laughs> Making sure that your night at the University of Massachusetts Club is one you'll remember forever. <laughs> That's your people. It's not about the money, though. You know, I've been dwelling on that over and over and over again. Your contribution does more than that. It gives me something to brag about with the money. So yeah, sometimes it's about the money. It depends on the audience. But for me, what is most important is supporting our research, supporting our students, supporting faculty initiatives, our undergraduate, our graduate initiatives. Those annual gifts make it possible for us to do what we do every day on the campus, whether it's fellowships, whether it's books. Students come up to us, they don't have books. We can rely on that, technology, equipment, staying current, all those things make a difference, so thank you. And as much as we're tremendously grateful to you for your monetary donations, we're deeply indebted to you for the trust you've placed in us. 
I hope you understand that. Giving us the big T on the word trust makes a difference. And you show that. You could have given to any charity. And many of you give to so many charities. We're glad we're on the list. Thank you for putting us on the list, you mighty 3%. We're honored. You've consistently shown this support. And we're grateful to you. And so, year after year, through good economic times and bad economic times, you continually reaffirm your commitment to this university. You made our concerns. You made everything that we wanted to do as an institution possible. So after two decades, I think it's safe <laughs> that we can say you've done much more than chosen to support us. You've demonstrated an unwavering loyalty to us. You know that loyalty is one of the most treasured things that there is. Your loyalty makes a difference for us. So thank you for being loyal, University of Massachusetts, Boston folk. You know, thank you for helping change my attitude. You know, I had an attitude problem. I tell the story all the time when I came over here. So I came from one of those private universities <coughs> whose mission started wavering out the window. I was looking for some new life. And I got caught up in the mission. And before I knew it, I didn't show up for the commencement ceremonies at the other place. I was on the other campus ready to work. Because it resonated so well and it continues to do that. And so when my family and I had a chance to go other places in the world, the place we wanted to be was here. And the reason we wanted to be here is because of you in this room and what you represent and the feeling that it represents and the feeling that we get every time we're with you. This university has loyal donors. Tonight, we're going, to, we're going to celebrate each of you for setting such a high standard. Now, you know, you set a standard. So now when we're talking to young alumni who are just coming out of this institution, just starting out, no matter whether they're 73 or 23, 20 years is a standard. Well, I'm 73, I can't do it. Oh, I'm going to say I have an example of that. Well, I'm 23, I can't do it. Looking around the room, most of you were 23 when you started doing it. Bust a laugh. 23, you're only 46 now. <laughs> oh, you hot. Okay. So anyway, we'll make sure that that's happening. Now I have the pleasure of bringing to the podium two of our most loyal donors, alumni, Jim and Marie O'Sullivan. Come on up here. They're members of the class of 1980. Oh, she's gonna stay here. Well, I just can you stand up so we can see you though? This is a University of Massachusetts Boston love story. Not only is it a love story, they're unbelievable donors. Now, Jim is a graduate of the College of Management and a member of our Alumni Association Board. His wife also received her degree, Marie, in Sociology from the College of Liberal Arts. So we're so grateful. They're sharing their thoughts. They're going to be sharing their thoughts on why it was so important to them to support this university. Now, before he speaks, I am told that I'm supposed to reach down. She's got the checkbook. <laughs> I, I've already reached over in that pocket. <laughs> reach down, reach under, and I have a gift for you. This is an example of the gift that all of you are going to get. Come on up. That's why we wanted you to come up front. Okay? These are the gifts. Now, hold, okay. Now, what is it? Okay, it says University of Massachusetts, Boston, and it can be utilized for quite a few things, right? What would you use it for, Gina? You can put it in your office, you can bring it home, it's a beautiful crystal bowl. You can put potpourri in it. And I would probably have a whole bunch of chocolate covered raisins in it. <laughs> with a sprinkling of raisins mixed in with them, okay? That's what I would probably use, it's beautiful. And we're so grateful that we wanted to give you some token of this institution to have around in your space, okay? 
each one of you will have it before you leave here tonight. But I want to give Jim a chance to say hello for a moment. Uh, I'm going to try it without. Joe, if you can't hear me, let me know. But my, mother, <laughs> my mother graduated from the BC, uh, Boston, City Hall, Boston City Hospital School of Nursing in 1947. I want to speak very quickly on four points. Uh, first, Marie and I started giving in 1987. I had a friend, Marie had a very close friend who died in a very tragic helicopter crash back in April of 1986. His name was Vincent Mastercola. His nickname was Buster. And if anybody had a nickname that fit, Buster had a nickname that fit. But he graduated, got a bachelor's degree from UMass Amherst, and then came to UMass Boston and got a master's degree in chemistry. And he had the sense, back at the age of 29, to invest in some life insurance and to leave it to the university in a scholarship. So Marie and I started giving and got involved, at that point, raising money for the scholarship, the Vincent Mastercola Scholarship, and I think it's still the second largest endowed scholarship in the university. So that's how we get started. Second, my decision to come to UMass Boston was an easy one. I think Marie's was the same. Mom and Dad weren't going to pay our tuition. <laughs> so we came to UMass Boston. But when we started in September of 1975, I think the tuition was $192. I probably paid more for my books that semester than we paid for tuition and fees. And I was waiting tables in the 70s. And we could make enough money from May to August waiting tables to save enough money to pay tuition room and board virtually any college in the country. Students today cannot do that. If you could find a job today where you could save fifty or $60,000 in four months' time, you wouldn't go to college. You'd stay and work that job all year round. So we give because the students at UMass need the money, and they need it more than we did. The third, even if mom and dad had paid my tuition room and board, or perhaps I would have gone to another school, the best decision I made was to come to UMass Boston. First, I yeah. met the love of my life. Yes. <laughs> and second, I met a guy by the name of Lee Tubbs. Remember Lee yeah. Tubbs, Bill? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Lee was my very first mentor, and I know the reason I got into Northeastern Law School was because of the letter Lee wrote for me. We went down to see him a couple of years ago. We took the kids to Disney World, and he's, uh, he's in the, he's in the doctor program yeah. now. That we, yeah. we went down there just, and we took him out to dinner. It was nice to see him. He's, his hair's a lot whiter now than yeah, it was yeah. back in the 1970s. But. And finally, my, um, my last point is I'm very proud of UMass Boston. It's a very unique school. When we were there, the average age was 27. And most of us worked 25, 25 hours a week or more. Um, so the students there were much more serious, I think, than students at traditional schools. If you're 27 years old going back to school, you're not there for the parties on the weekend. Uh, we all, we had families, we had jobs. Even though we had more obligations than students from traditional school, I think when we graduated we were better prepared for life because of that. And then just to wrap up, really the proudest moment I've had uh, of UMass is when I went to Chancellor Motley's inauguration. Uh, I snuck in, I was in, I had an invitation, but he didn't know I was there. <laughs> but he had, a, his procession hit students from 89 different countries carrying the flags of their homeland. So we have students from 89 different countries attending UMass Boston. I don't know how many universities can state that. And then lastly, just the week before the inauguration, I was watching a film on the History Channel about the Tuskegee Airmen. And who were the honor guard but, uh, for Keith with the Tuskegee Airmen? I, I don't cry very often, but I was crying. I did. I'm very proud. That was Thank a very, very moving inauguration. Really nice. So, and so, it's with gratitude that I stand before you as your chancellor. It's with gratitude that I um, stand here ready.
to continue to work throughout this globe to make sure that we have the resources for our students, for our faculty, and beyond. Right now, your vice chancellor couldn't be with you because he's in London. Why is he in London? Because one of our recent alums, Dr. Edwin Moses, yes, that Edwin Moses, the international track star, Olympian, um, is there and is, is ready to commit to a gift to this institution. And so we went to London to make sure that he understood that we can reach out wherever we can to be there. And Arthur Mavitt, one of our wonderful alums, is in Scotland. And we would have went to Scotland to see him. He chairs our chancellor uh, board, but he does a lot of work overseas. And so we're everywhere. Your alums are everywhere, but it started with you. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.